I want to welcome to the show, Andrew McConnell. Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Melissa. It's wonderful to be here. I am excited to talk with you. You're a super fascinating person um, with all the things that you're doing. And I love that you how you have taken your success and now you're wanting to help regular people such as myself to thrive in their life and to find peace and clarity through your book, Get Out of My Head. Talk just a little bit about you and your own journey and what led you to this path. Yeah, so my background, I I went to law school. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, civil rights and human rights, and got my dream job working exactly what I wanted to work on, education funding, all of this. And I was miserable and mm -hmm. realized, oh, just because I'm passionate about these things, that's not necessarily what my calling for my profession, for my career would be. And I found that I was really excited problem solving in the realm of business and hearing a problem, being able to work on that. And so I ended up going into consulting. And one of the benefits of that was I was able through that consulting and taking that business lens and that training to then work for school districts to do work. Uh, I lived and worked in, in Afghanistan for a year doing economic development work. So you could take that framework of problem solving and put it towards some of those issues that I was really passionate about. And then a partner that I worked with at McKinsey recruited me away to a startup. And I grew the the business line I was running there from 4 million to 20 million in a year. I said, whoa, this, this startup thing's fun. Maybe <laughs> I should go try to do this myself. And so 10 years ago, this month, I actually started my first company, Vacation Futures, in the vacation rental industry. It was a marketplace business. Then I started a fintech company in the vacation rental industry. And now I have a, a software company that does dynamic pricing for vacation rentals and Airbnbs called rented.com. Mm -hmm. So uh, lots of business stuff. And you're obviously like a very intelligent person. I mean, you went to Harvard. Um, I don't know what that ranks in the best schools, but in my mind, it's like number one in the <laughs> US, you know, the top school. So what led you into then getting into this idea of helping people to develop their leadership styles or developing just their everyday life to be healthier? Yeah, it. Early in my career at McKinsey, I was very fortunate to have a, a mentor who just really cared about me and, and helped a lot. And that made such a difference in my career that I really wanted to do the same for others and, and mentor. And right around when I was starting my companies, I, I went back through an exercise of defining my personal values. And at first I tried to do 10 and then mm -hmm. tracking them. I realized I'm not really living 10 authentically mm -hmm. and consistently, right? Like let's distill it down to five. And then what is the actual priority? And my first prioritized list, my, I looked at how I was living and that wasn't how I was prioritizing. I had to mm -hmm. redraft it. And so I ended up with a list that my number one priority is and was growth. And it's growth and learning, growing as a person, growing in my knowledge, growing in my skill set. And a few years into that, I, I came to this realization that learning and growth is a, a really selfish act mm. unless you do something with it, unless mm. you do something to benefit others. And so I started writing. I started really taking, okay, great. I read this. I had this amazing insight. I put this into practice in my own life. How can I share this so that other people can, can benefit from this? And so I started doing monthly articles for Forbes on some of these lessons I was learning from everything I was learning as I was growing. And then the pandemic hit and things that used to take up time, right? Social events, all this stuff, it wasn't there. And so, uh, mm -hmm. wait, I have more time. Mm -hmm. How can I use this time again to share this learning, share this growth with others? And that led me to, to writing the book, Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so to, I'm curious about the, the path that you chose in terms of like getting out of my head that leads me to believe that you probably like the the rest of us deal with negative thinking or unhealthy thoughts. I, I'm curious about your own journey and then what led to this book. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I am a human. Yeah. <laughs> because that <laughs> me is, too. That's, that's what happens with humans. And, and yeah. so people say, well, how, how do I fix this? I say, well, let's just, let's call it what it is. You're never going to stop your subconscious mind. You can't stop the voices. You can't stop that negative thought. What you can do is get better at noticing when it's cropping up yeah. and then deciding, do I want to engage with this or not? You know, the, the analogy I, I write, right. I come from a vacation rental industry. I come from this industry where we rent out properties to other people. 
And the, the tagline we used to always use, the description we would always use is, hey, we'll help you maximize the value of your most valuable asset. And I was building this company and I realized, wait, I'm neglecting a far more valuable asset. The most valuable asset is actually our mind. Mm -hmm. We can't own anything else. Russian billionaires have shown us that whatever we think we own can be taken away, mm -hmm. right? Governments, armies, whatever it is, can come take away these things we think we own. Our body, mm -hmm. we say, oh, well, slavery doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. like, we own our body. Well, a virus or a bacteria can argue with that and say, no, mm -hmm. I'll come take over your body. I can, mm -hmm. I can kill you like that if I want. Mm -hmm. We don't own that. We own our mind. Mm -hmm. And yet we spend our entire life giving it away. We give it away to social media. Mm -hmm. We give it away to the news cycle. We give it away to the person who cut us off in traffic and put us in a bad mood for two hours. Mm -hmm. They didn't put you in a bad mood. They cut you off in traffic. You decided you wanted to be in a bad mood and gave your mood to that person. And so I once I realized, wait, I say I'm helping these people maximize the value of their <laughs> most precious asset, but I'm just wasting my most precious asset mm -hmm. that I started thinking about this concept of mind ownership versus rentership. Mm. And when you talk about those negative thoughts and other things, right? We can't decide, we can't control, unless we're in a gated community, maybe, if someone walks by our front door. Mm -hmm. We don't control it. But what we can just control is if we open the door up and say, hey, do you want to just move in here with me and you know trash my house and eat all my food? And a squatter. <laughs> right. We get to decide that. Mm. And it's the same with our mind. We can't control if the thought passes by. But we get to control how much of that space we then want to let it have after the fact. Mm -hmm. And that that's really what set me on this journey of, okay, why are we living our lives? Why is the default to live our lives as tenants of our mind as opposed to owners when it's the one thing we can and should own? Mm, that's really good. So what do you feel like is that difference, the delineating factors between ownership versus renting in regards to our minds? Yeah. So the the difference is proactivity versus reactivity, right? So if my I just default to whatever idea is there, whatever mood, the person cut me off, I'm angry and I just let that control and I'm just left with whatever's remaining after I gave that away, that's rentership. I just gave that to the other person. They own it. They don't know I exist, mm -hmm. but they own my mind, whether they know I exist or not. An owner notices, oh, that person just walked by my front yard. Okay. There they go. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go about my day. I'm not going to open the door and let them move in. Mm -hmm. That's an owner. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so hard for us to own our minds versus renting out that space? Because of our biology, because we're humans, because <laughs> we, to survive, we evolved brains that were the exact opposite, right? So you think about humans, 250, 300,000 years, we're here. And 99.8% of that time, we're not living in cities, right? Mm -hmm. We're out in the plains, we're out hunting, we're gathering. And we're pulling in, and our brains still work this way. We pull in 11 million bits of data per second, yeah. right? All the sights, the sounds, the smells, the feeling that we have, our brain is pulling all this in. But we can only process still back then and still only process 50 bits, 11 million down to 50. So you think, okay, well, what are those 50 going to be? Well, say we had an ancestor who was looking at this beautiful horizon, zebras grazing, gazelles, giraffes, beautiful sunset, and there's a rustling to the side. And they say, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy this beautiful scenery. I, I'm going to stop and smell the roses. They're going to die. Even the, Yeah. The one out of a thousand times, that's a lion. They got eaten. Those genes did not come to us. Yeah. Or say we had someone who... They listen to it. They say, okay, wait, I want to listen to this. But you know what? 99 times out of 100, it's a muskrat. It's not mm -hmm. that big of a deal. They're an optimist. Mm -hmm. That 100th time, mm -hmm. they got eaten. Their genes did not come to mm -hmm. us. The people who survived, this is a quote from Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel, former mm -hmm. CEO, only the paranoid survive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the one that focuses out of the 11 million amazing things, bits of information, focuses on the worst case and then extrapolates that to the worst possible case, those were the genes that survived. Mm. And these were things that people started having to deal with when they started living in civilization, when they started living in cities, because once you had 
books, once you had this new creation of information, you weren't dealing with the same constant threat to your life in your day-to-day -day life. So this was a problem 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, which is why the Stoics or the Lao Tzu with Taoism, or honestly, if you go back to Ju Judeo-Christian thinking, and a lot of what prayer comes from is this being able to release, to be able to step away from it and accept mm -hmm. you know, what is in my control and what is not. And if it was a problem 2,000 years ago, think about how much of a problem it is now. We're with so the constant overstimulated. Change. So much data. So it's estimated in the year 2015, we created more information than all of human history before that year. Wow. In 2017, we created more data than 2015 and 16 combined. And now we're to a point where every single day with TikTok videos, with blogs, with podcasts, with books, with everything we're going out there, every single day, we create more data than all of human history did prior to the year 1900. We do that every day on top, on top, on top. How can our brain that still goes from 11 million down to 50 possibly deal with this. So this is why all of us find ourselves lying in bed, not being able to sleep because we're worried about something that might happen or something that happened in the past. Why we think we're present with family. We're sitting, we want to be present. We want to have this dinner, but we're thinking about what happened at work or we pick up our mm -hmm. phone because you know social media, an another alert popped up on our phone. We're human. We, we can't stop that biology. What we can do is better understand it. Mm -hmm. And start putting some practices into place to reclaim that ownership that we we have the right and the ability to get. Mm -hmm. So really, the first step is just acknowledging: Am I really owning my own mind, or am I giving it away? Would Would you agree with that? Hundred percent, right? Like, am I living my life as an owner or as a tenant? Am I giving it away? Are there mm -hmm. times that I am giving it away? Right? If I'm sitting and I decide I'm going to watch thirty minutes of Netflix. And an hour and a half later, it's still on the autoplay next feature. Mm -hmm. Did I own my mind in time? Mm -hmm. Or did Netflix own my mind in time? Did I just default to what it was choosing for me? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Sobering, isn't it? It takes some <laughs> personal responsibility, which is hard to do. I think especially when we're not used to, I think, having those boundaries or guardrails on our time. I think social media is definitely like an obvious use of distraction and not owning our mind. But are there other things, Andrew, that you feel like are in the everyday common life that keep us from practicing oh. ownership? I, oh, I, think we're, I think we're quick to blame social media on everything. And I think that's a big part of it, but it's only a part of it. It hundred percent only a part, right? I, if you go back and read uh, magazine articles from the late nineties, early two thousands, it was video games. Yeah. And if you go back 2000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, it was the written word, right? Socrates yeah. was so worried what the written <laughs> word would do. So the, the concerns are new, but the fact that there's something concerning is as old as civilization. Mm -hmm. And, and when you say, are, are there things besides social media? Yes. I mean, it's everything around us. So it, it really is three big buckets. It's other people. So separate from social media, maybe that's one way they get in front of us. Because social media is just a social communication of other people through this medium, but it's other people. It could be direct conversation. It could be a text. It could be uh, just thinking what this other person might be thinking or saying or doing, right? Yeah. So other people, that's that's maybe one of the most obvious. Then it's events and circumstances outside our control. Could be weather events, could be a sport match, right? <laughs> like <laughs> Anything. Like, yeah. Anything that we're not a party to. We we don't control this event. We don't control the circumstance. And then the third one's really the most difficult. And that's these different and imagined versions of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Oh, well, the me of the future or the me of the past, or mm -hmm. if I was this better person, or why am I not more like this? Mm -hmm. These These voices in our head that are telling us we're not good enough, or we're, we're not living up to what we want to be. That's the most difficult because it's already, it's, it's living in there, mm -hmm. right? These others, we kind of let in time to time, but this other one's living with us 24 seven. And we just have to decide, is that the us we want to give our mind to, or do we want to give it to the us that's conscious and, and actually can be in the driver's seat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you said that third one, I was like, oh yeah, that's me. Including it's having, every, like, it's everyone. <laughs> including having like imaginary conversations. Yeah. You know what oh, I mean? 100%. Where, 
oh, I'm going to, I'm going to say this and then they're going to say that. And then I'm going to say this and, you know, like living out this whole thing. And by the end of it, who knows how long this takes, right? Like it's usually when I'm getting ready in the morning, but like, so like say 30 minutes, I've like totally wasted that 30 minutes because all I've done is worried and now I'm in a bad mood and I've totally given away all that space. Yeah. I mean, before you said, is the first step recognizing that we're living as a tenant instead of owner? Uh, maybe even the step before that is uh, forgiving ourselves for it, right? Like er, not even know, thinking that we have to forgive ourselves, just acknowledging, hey, we're human. It's not mm-hmm. that there's a fault with me. It's that I'm mm-hmm. a human being living in this world that my brain was not designed for. Like I'm mm-hmm. living in a situation that is not setting me up for mm-hmm. success. But knowing that, how can I now better position myself for success? Yeah, I love that acceptance of self. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the other piece, when you talk about playing the, that conversation in your, in your head, now there's only one time that ever exists. There's only one time that we live. And that is now by definition, the only time we can ever live is the present. The past is only in existence in our mind. That's why different people have different histories and everything, because it, it is literally only exists in the imagination, same for the future. And so The question is, how much of your life do you want to live in the future, right? It may be really useful to pre-play that conversation out of like, hey, I'm going to go in to this very difficult conversation with my spouse, with my children's teacher, with um, my, my boss on a salary negotiation or something. And I want to strategize for that. I want to plan. What, what do I want to say? Let me practice that. What might some of their responses be so that I'm prepared for that? That can be a useful exercise as long as you're deciding as an owner, Mm -hmm. this is how I want to spend, right? This is how I want to spend this 30 minutes. I want to go plan on this. If on the other hand, (laughs) you're at the dinner table or you're laying in bed and you say, Hey, I want to spend this time getting sleep. So I'm well rested for the conversation tomorrow. But instead you're just playing this conversation on loop. Then you're a tenant to that, allowing that to take over. And so it's just being conscious of what do you want to focus on and when. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point to bring up. We hear a lot about being present. So I think by this point in our lives, we know that we quote, should be present. But when you think about the present being the only now, when you said that, like, I noticed my forehead hurting, like to think about the past not existing, (laughs) the future not existing. The only thing that existing is right now is now. Can you, can you like peel that back a little bit further? Cause I think that's a really good thing to think about, not just to be present, but that the present is the only thing that is present. I mean, yeah. So it, the, the, there's a reason the word for present like gift yeah, is the same as present as in now it, it comes from the same old French roots. It's because the moment that we're given the now is this gift. And we're only ever given it right now. Because as soon as this passes, it's gone forever. That is the one time we have that moment. And yet at least 47% of our time, they've done studies on this, we're living at a time other than right now. Mm. So you're not living the only time that you live half of the time. Maybe that's right for some people. Maybe maybe some people say, look, a quarter of the time, I want to think back and learn lessons from the past to make my now better. And so that, that 50% is going to be that much better because I learned from the past. And I want the future to be better. So I'm going to spend 25% of my time planning and getting ahead of the future. My guess is that describes no one. No, yeah. one's, no one's allocating yeah. that time intentionally and ending up in that spot. Instead, they're just replaying Things I should have said this. I should have done that. I should, and they're not learning or, anything. Or romanticizing better. it, right? Like that was, it was so good back then. Or, or it would be so good in the future, right? Like th- this was was huge awakening for me. Of, you know, my grandfather passed away uh, during COVID, and this he didn't retire till he was eighty years old, right? Like he worked every day of his life, and thinking that there's this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of, Hey, I can put off happiness until I get to this point. I say, well, why would you wait 80 years? Like, why, why couldn't I craft a life where I'm happy today, every day? Mm -hmm. Because your life is an accumulation of your days. 
and we don't know how many days we get. That's Why right. would I ever want to lose one of those? Right. Yeah. It makes me emotional. To think about it from that point of view. My husband had a near death experience at age 35 and, um, I am, I hate that that happened to him and the effects that that has left him with. Um, but for our marriage, for the way we live our life and our family, we don't, we're not waiting until 80. Right. Like we live right. our life now and we've had some like really amazing experiences because like today is the only thing that we have. But I do think it's so boring to think about like how much of, how, and, and as you're listening, like think about like how much of your day is like actually thinking about your day. Like how much are you actually in that moment? Because I think about only having 50% of our life. I mean, most of us want to live longer, right? Like we, we want to be healthier. We don't want to get like yeah. cancer. We, we don't want to be obese. Like we think about all these things, but how much of our now are we actually living? That's a, that's a very sobering thought to have. And, and living, because th there's another piece there where you said thinking about right now that you can overanalyze it. I mean, yeah. how much of your time is just <laughs> living? Yeah. Right. It's, it's almost, I, I catch myself at times where you're in that flow state, right? I'm playing with my daughter. We're, we're having a tickle fight and it's just mm -hmm. giggling and giggling. And then I have no idea how much time has passed, but then I look up and think, oh man, I'm really enjoying this. And then it starts to become, oh, now but I've gotten in my own no, head. Enjoy, it, enjoy it. that you're right. enjoying Instead it. Instead <laughs> of just being there being. and enjoying it. Yeah. I wonder what age kids lose that. Because I think when they're your kid, I think your whole life is in the now, which which is why it feels like your childhood lasts forever, right? Like scientists have, researchers have found that when you're doing new experiences and you're in the moment, like time just seems to stretch. Yeah. I wonder when we lose that. It, it is a very profound question, I, I think. Because, I mean, you think about it and a four-year-old doesn't worry if she has food in her teeth. Right, she does not have that concern and self. She's in the moment, and as a parent, we can get frustrated of why were you not paying attention to this? Yeah. Well, because they were so in the now, mm -hmm. they were so in the moment that they're living there. They're not worried about all these distractions coming from the sides. They're there, they're living, and so I. That's one of those things. I don't know how much is biology, right? Like uh, juvenile brains are only able to single track process, right? So mm -hmm. they're almost forced to live in the now it's mm -hmm. this blessing in many ways that you're, you're living in the now you get this expandable time as a result and then our, our brains grow up and we can start mm -hmm. to worry and do these other things which help us plan for the future and learn from the past um, but it's this blessing and it's this curse that it also comes with this cost that we're not necessarily well equipped to deal with so that's that's a biological side then there's a societal side right you get to middle school and there are all sorts of cliques and social pressures and everything. And so uh, a common question I get is, well, who is this book for, right? And initially it was very much early career people, people just getting started. Hey, before you go into the work world, you decide how much of your life and your mind you want to give to work, to uh, your friends, to your family. Like how much is yours? What What is that life you want to craft now, as opposed to waiting 30 years down the line and looking up and saying, wait, how did I get here? This isn't where right. I wanted to be. For that, and then for kind of mid-career people who all of a sudden did look up and say, "Whoa, this isn't where I meant to get," and they kind of want that fresh start. But saying that, there's another side of me going back to the point you're making. It's like, man, if if you could teach some of these concepts and these skills and these, because the books just every chapter has tactical exercises. Okay, yeah, great, so good. You get this aha, but now what do you do with it? How do right. I now go live in a different and better way? And if you could teach those skills to teenagers, to, mm -hmm. to middle schoolers, what impact could that have on the rest of their lives? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a, that's an open question for me. Yeah. And also the thought of how can we help our kids to, to stretch that out as long as possible? I'm thinking about, I have a 14 year old and an 11 year old. And I think back to when they were younger and how much I rushed them. You mm. know what I mean? Like we got to go. We got to go. Let, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Like, let's do this faster. Let's do that faster. And you know how that was robbing them of their now. And we, we have to live in life. I mean, we can't, we can't just like let every moment linger. Yeah. I mean, there, I think there's just some practicalities, but I think it's just interesting from a parenting application as well. Like how can we learn from our kids 
and bring those experiences in and how long, how can we let them be kids for as long as they can? I had, I had one of those moments this weekend. Again, we were, my daughter loves like, let's tickle monster, tickle monster. Right. So how we're old tickling, is she? she's six. Aww. Uh, and, and we had, uh, and normally I'm not ticklish, right? Like I'm like, I'm not going to be ticklish. He said, I want to tickle you daddy. And so, you know, you can get in your mind, am I going to be ticklish or not? And so I was, I was laughing. She's like, wait, are mm-hmm. you really laughing? Is this ticklish? And I described to her how you can control that and like teaching her the skill, but then she was able to turn it off. Mm-hmm. And so the next morning, you know, I write her some emails and everything mm-hmm. to this account that I'll give her when she's 18. Oh, like nice. this is actually this really sad moment of like, I'm, I love that I taught you the skill, but I don't know if that was the last time you'll ever want the tickle monster, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know if that, that killed something too. Mm-hmm. And it's just you they they grow up and but you you lose something in each step so you it's it's back to just appreciating every moment that you do get Mm -hmm. yeah not knowing when that moment is like the last moment yeah uh my daughter she's like I said she's 11 and over I think it was over the summer she just said I feel like my childhood is over and I didn't enjoy my childhood the way that I wish that or I think that I should have and so whenever she is doing something really silly, I'm like, that's you enjoying your childhood and just bringing that to her attention. I'm like, you're, you're doing it. You're very much an 11 year old. And that was very childlike what you just did. Yeah. And, and that you can have some of those moments too, when you're 45, right? totally. like you can, you can revert and just have that silly moment of getting tickled or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Of, yeah. You, you can get that childish glee, but you still in those instances, you don't know the last time you'll jump rope, the last time mm-hmm. you'll play, you know, one of those clapping games, right? You, mm-hmm. you don't know when the last time for any of these things are. So mm-hmm. really being able to, to be in it mm-hmm. and, and just enjoy it. I'm curious for you, and I'm sure there's practices in the book as well, but what do you feel like, Andrew, are some just things that we can implement to, to practice being in the now, not to think about being in the now or putting the pressure of being in the now, but simply opening ourselves up to the experience of being here and taking that ownership of whether it be our minds, our emotions, relationships, because I think there's so many different applications, but to be in the present. This one may be too practical or or maybe it's just right now practical, but one, one exercise that I think I find incredibly useful and a lot of others is this concept of zero based calendaring. And so we think about a budget. And we look back and say, oh, well, here's what we spent in the past. And this next year, we're going to have a little more for food because of inflation and this. And so you kind of reset your budget. The the more effective way to do it is this concept of zero-based. Say, okay, we have this new period. Let's start from scratch. What do I actually need and want for the coming period? And we, we can do the same with our lives. Like a lot of people live out of their calendar. And they're kind of reactive to it. Things get added in, added in. And so you look for it and you're like, okay, well, I have two hours free out of all, you know, 140 or 68 um, next week. And so are you just tweaking the the edges or are you designing, here's the life I want? Mm-hmm. And so this, this concept of zero-based calendaring is you go in and say, how many hours or what percent of my life do I want to give to these different things? To work, to sleep, to family, to exercise, to faith, Right actually blocking those times and then adding them up. Is there that much time in the week? If not, you know, what's going to give, what, what do I have to cut to make it fit? And then once you have that design, what I do is every Friday, I look forward to the next week and say, Hey, is my life holding up to this design that I had that I wanted to live? And it's not a one-time exercise. So every quarter I revisit this. And I double click for work, right? So I say, okay, how much time for clients? How much time for my investors? How much time for learning? How much time for working on my product? All all these different pieces. And that answer changes depending on where we are in the the calendar year and and what I have to do on reporting and other things. And so knowing how we want to proactively design and then tracking on the front end, hey, does my next week before the week passes, before I enter the week, Mm -hmm. does it look like I want it to look? And then the the really, really tough piece is having a separate audit 
of, okay, did I do these things? But where was my mind? Yeah. Because I could have technically had my body in each of these activities and places. But I said I wanted eight hours of sleep, but 90 minutes of that each night, I was thinking about work. Okay, well, did I really adhere to this calendar I said, or did I give my mind mm. as a tenant to, to work there? And, you know, some cases may say, okay, maybe if I, instead of saying eight hours of sleep, I said seven and a half and I gave 30 extra minutes to work each night mm-hmm. and said, okay, after I get the kids to bed, I'm going to spend 30 minutes planning my next day so that I'm in a great spot. So that now when I go to sleep, I'm actually present in sleep as opposed to worried about all the things that I didn't close out the day before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it's really those three steps, design what you want, audit that your calendar looks like you want it to be, and then check is your mind mapping to where you said your calendar was. Mm-hmm. And if it's not mapping, because I'm sure there's always areas of growth, do you have little strategies or ideas of ways to get more in the present to where we can be fully more fully engaged? Yeah, it, it really is building that muscle of noticing. Ooh, I right? like that. Yeah. So it's it, kind of you, where you we can't started start this. off with a hundred pounds. You start off with five pounds. Exactly. Exactly. You have to build the muscle and most of us come into it day one, totally unconscious that this is happening. So just first, the first step awareness of, wait, this does describe me. I I do find myself 30 minutes later realizing I just went off on a tangent in my head and I wasn't doing the thing I meant to, that I wanted to do. And so getting in that practice of noticing, which can be as simple as, okay, you know what I'm going to do? is every 60 minutes, I'm going to set the the timer on my alarm to just check in and say, where's my head right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. This is what I was saying. And it doesn't have to be that frequently, but just having a cadence where you check in with yourself. Say, what am I thinking about right now? Mm -hmm. And as you get more and more used to doing it, you don't need the external prompts. You'll find yourself better at doing it. Mm -hmm. You, You won't become perfect. You don't turn off the subconscious voice it's there mm-hmm. you just get to where you have the muscle and the the ability to recognize when it turns on and say oh do i want to put you on mute or do i want to let you keep talking mm-hmm. yeah i think you begin to know at least with myself i can feel the difference of whenever i'm being mindful and present versus living in my head because then i typically have more anxiety I feel more distracted. Mm -hmm. I find myself on my phone more or something like that because I'm wanting to numb versus actually being in the moment and taking ownership and doing what I can do in that moment. And a lot of times, so when you talk about you're you're running to that thing to to numb, to to get out of it, right? If we're noticing the same thing maybe cropping up, hey, every time I'm checking in, it's the same thing. Maybe we need to deal with that one thing. Maybe, maybe the answer isn't to just keep turning it off. Mm-hmm. Maybe the answer is, hey, you know what? I need to go carve 30 minutes, an hour to go deal with this thing. This fight mm-hmm. that I had with my sister, I need to address that. This, this has been two weeks now, and I find myself four times a day going back to it. This is not healthy for me. I need to do something about it other than realizing that it keeps popping up. Sometimes mm-hmm. we have to notice what's coming And then just address it Mm -hmm. and seeing the why behind it and going after that. I love that. So Andrew, there's, there's so many different applications and we didn't even get to the stoic wisdom. Um, I would, I would, do you mind just sharing a a quick little piece of how that wisdom influences the book and, and even your own personal practices? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think we were talking about the, there was a debate with my publisher on, do we include stoicism in the title or not? And they said, have you seen how many books Ryan Holiday sells go with, <laughs> include Stoic? Uh, but my point being that Stoicism doesn't have a monopoly on these human truths. That they're human truths. They're in prayer. They're in Taoism, Buddhism. They're, they're in these other um, traditions and faiths. And Stoicism for me just provided this very structured tactical framework. And so the, the book in Stoicism come back to this idea of there are things in our control and there are things that are not. And that world of things in our control is limited to our mind and our mindset. 
everything else is outside our control. It's right. it's basically the serenity prayer, right? Yeah. Like that that is stoicism. And the the book takes uh, these stoic principles to address those three groups: the renting our mind to or from other people, to events and circumstances outside our control, to different and imagined versions of ourselves, and has these thirteen tactics of how to reclaim it. So knowing your value, setting your boundaries, learning to accept the gift of criticism, mm. being grateful for all that comes, right? You, you talked about your husband's near-death experience. And it's it's those things that you would never wish on anyone else. Right. But you're eternally grateful for what they've given you. Right. Right. And, and being able to have that gratitude that, hey, I am a product of all that came. So it's, it's these different uh, kind of exercises and, and tenets of stoicism mm -hmm. that introduce what the stoic tenet is, what it addresses in, in those categories, and then illustrates it with modern day living examples. So the founder of DocuSign, Navy SEALs, Olympians, artists, musicians, entrepreneurs, uh, all, all different people so that people recognize, right? It's not just yeah. all business people. It's not just all athletes. It, it's people from all walks of life who've taken these principles and applied it in a very modern context to really, really positive effect. And then knowing, you know, G.I. Joe said, learning is half the battle. <laughs> yeah, but the battle is only one if you 100% get the battle. And so doing is the other half. And so every chapter closes with these very tactical exercises, like the zero-based calendaring, like mm -hmm. a lifeline exercise, um, like being able to budget your time and audit your time. Uh, and and that's all available, honestly, as a, a free download on my website. The, the workbook is pulled out separately from the book for those that want to get to work. Perfect. Where can we find that and where can we find you? Yeah. So my website is mandrewmcconnell.com. And you can certainly find me, contact me through there. The, the book's available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, everywhere. It's on Kindle, hardback, Audible, all, all the different versions. Uh, and then please connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I'd love to continue the conversation and continue the the journey as we all work to maintain and reclaim that mind ownership. It's it's ongoing work, right? It's not like we eat well for a week and we say, yeah, okay, good. now we're done. <laughs> or we exercise for two days and we say, great, I'm good for the rest of my life. It, mm -hmm. it is ongoing work. This is our life. This is our mind. This is what we have to work on to have the mind, have the life that we want. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. You bet.